Hey, I see two people that signed on. Welcome, welcome. I'm Jennifer Brennan, and um, I'm the Horticulture Information Specialist here at Chalet, and uh, this is Edible Gardening. So I have a bad feeling. Let me check something. Um, I was informed that the handout, which is really good, and it's all of the uh, information that's on the PowerPoint, uh, it was not going to be sent out till after the, the presentation. So um, let me check something really quick. Maybe that changed. And I'm checking, checking, checking. And it doesn't look like it's going to, it doesn't look like it went out beforehand. So sorry. So I'll just do a really good presentation and you'll get the notes afterwards to, 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 to go over. And then I have a reward for you too. So I'll show you that uh, when we uh, get going. It is 9.56. So we have four minutes before we start and I have tons of information to share with you. So um, I'll wait to share the screen. Well, maybe I'll share the screen now. I'm gonna share the screen now. Hold on, hold on. You're sharing the screen because that will get everybody in the mood and then they'll know they're at the right spot. Uh, where is it? There it is. Da -da. Share. Okay, ooh, showing, showing my cards in advance of playing. Okay, we're gonna start from the beginning. Wait, it's not doing that. There we go. Hi, everybody. Now I can look over here still. Yeah. Okay, the numbers are clicking up. We have seven people, including uh, six people, including me. And um, this is edible gardening. I understand that my handout didn't get sent out. It will be sent out after the presentation. And also with a link to the, um, the seeds that you can purchase online, which is pretty cool. Oh my gosh, I've got photos of what the store looks like right now with all the seeds set up. So it's going to really tease you into coming into Chalet, even on this cold, cold day. I have to confess, um, I walk from the Chalet um, garden shop or the garden center building over to our administrative office building. It's the Chalet house over here in the parking lot. And I gotta tell you, even my 40 below jacket did not feel comfortable <laughs> this morning. So, um, so, so I, I'm going to really tempt you to come out and, and, and get all, the, all your ingredients and all your supplies for seed starting and getting into and enjoying um, gardening edibles. So there's so much, there's so much to cover and so much fun stuff to cover. So this is gonna be a really fun, a fun day. I, some other people have signed on. Welcome, welcome. I'm Jennifer Brennan. I'm the horticulture information specialist at Chalet. I've been here, oh my gosh, this is the end of, this is the end of January. So by the, the end of February, I will be working at Chalet 31 years. Oh my goodness. It's a good thing I do hair color, huh? So um, now if you do have any questions, um, please put them in the question and answer column rather than the chat one. It's, it's much easier for me to keep track of questions and make sure you get your answers that way. So I'm gonna go through and I'm covering anything and everything that you can imagine. So, you know, you can put your questions, but I won't answer them until the end. And I, I have a feeling I will answer them as I get through all the materials. Um, so let me see, we've got 13 people. That's my lucky number. That's my, oh, 14. Okay, welcome, welcome. Jennifer Brennan here. I'm the horticulture, horticulture information specialist at Chalet. And this is Edible Gardening. Um, I was notified, I think it was late last night or early this morning that the, um, the handout is being sent out in an email after the presentation. So I apologize for that. Um, we do have them printed up here and available in the store at the diagnostic desk where the, um, uh, at the plant health area. That's where my microscope is in the garden essentials part of the store. Oh, and guess what? Garden essentials is getting set back up. 
And um, and then and then I have a fun prize for you um, for those who stay to, to the end. And we have 18, boy, those numbers are ticking up. Very good, very good. And we're getting really close to the start time. Okay. Everything that uh, you're going to see on the screen um, will be printed in the handout that you'll get. They'll, they'll be sending an email of, of that after the lecture is finished. I know, I don't understand it either, but it was a communication thing, I think. But anyway, it's so fun to see all the seeds set up, especially after we get all the Christmas stuff put away and sold off. And then um, we, we kicked off the season really well. We brought in 4,000 tropical foliage plants and had them on sale. If you spent uh, uh, $75 or more, you got 25 off the top. And that included the plants, pots, potting mix, um, fertilizers, insecticides, fungicides, all those goodies. And so it was really easy to take advantage of a wonderful sale. And that goes on through the 31st. And then we had a, another special offer um, for free delivery on any purchases over a hundred dollars. So that's pretty cool. Okay, we've got, ooh, the number's just ticking up, ticking up, ticking up. Welcome everybody. So this is Edible Gardening and um, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna go ahead and get started because uh, I've got so much to cover on, you know, on here. Oh, and she says, I need to get in the right spot. Okay, here we go. Okay, now the four questions that you need to ask yourself when you want to decide what to grow an animal. So, so it's what do you buy from the grocery store on a regular basis? And uh, what meals show up on your family's menu each month? And which foods provides the highest value? Um, so if you want to, you, you know, you know, grow the heirloom tomatoes that are more expensive in the grocery store, that's a great, a great option. Uh, and again, what expense, what vegetables are the expensive ones to buy? Those are the ones you might want to grow in your garden. Or if you just want to be able to, you know, control your own um, fertilizing, control what goes on your crops <clears throat> as far as any insecticides uh, or fungicides, then, you know, when you grow your own, you know exactly how they've been raised. And then what will make you happy to grow in your own garden? I have to tell you, I have to confess, I love cucumbers. I love growing my own cucumbers. There is just nothing like a fresh cucumber directly out of your garden. So I grow at least four different types and I love going out and harvesting the cucumbers. And then I actually could eat a cucumber with every meal. So, so that's what you know. Now there are five tips um, that I want to kind of put into your, you know, your head for a successful season. You, you should really have a permanent design of your garden beds and paths to your garden and through your garden. So you're not walking on the soil and um, compressing the soil. You know, when you compress the soil, roots can't grow through it. So you want to reduce your weeding any chance you can get. And by putting mulch down, um, that's the secret. You keep your soil covered with two inches of mulch anything that's not planted with the plant that you planted. And that keeps the seeds from germinating. If the sun can't get to the seeds, they can't germinate. You wanna keep garden records. And that just means keeping track of what you planted and when you planted, and then having a diagram. So you remember where and everything is. Again, make a map of the garden and put it in a binder and then write down everything you plant with each season. Uh, one of my, one of my Former coworkers Scott Bowman was fabulous about doing that, and he just had it in a spiral notebook. Every year he wrote it down, and he could look back to see what he planted, what he liked, what he didn't like, what was new, and it, you have it all there at your fingertips. Um, and then join a community, whether it's you know community garden or you come to chalet on a regular basis, and share your information with um, a sales staff here or the um, you know or the um, 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 you know, your, your friends and your gardeners. It, it's really, gardening is more fun when you share it with a community of equally passionate people. Okay, interesting. This is a planting calculator that I discovered when I was doing some research for this. And this is a company called Johnny's Seeds. It's a seed catalog. We don't carry these seeds because it's a catalog only, but you can go to this webpage and click on it 
and then type in your different crops and it will tell you what, you, what you do is you type in your zip code. And when you type in your zip code, it tells you the best date for your zip code to plant your seeds inside, start your seeds inside or plant them outside. Now I have a secret that I'm gonna share with you. And, and I'm, I was actually gonna do this at the end if you stayed with me all the way through it. This is, a, it's called a garden planner. I'll, I'll put it out on the larger screen, but it's a garden planner. It's done by a family at Clyde is the owner. They're from Missouri and um, they have made these. We used to always sell these, we used to order these. And then the last time we placed an order was 2010 because people just weren't gardening, like you know, vegetable gardening, like they are now. Um, COVID has changed the whole attitude about people's gardening. So I had a, we had to clean out a closet and I found a whole case of these. So I'm gonna give these to you as a reward for attending this, the webinar. But there's kind of a, it's a lure to get you to come in to buy your seeds and buy your products. When you're coming in person, you get to pick this up, it's free. And um, I'll, I'll show you how it works at the end of the, of, 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 of the lecture. So this is something on in hand that you'll have. It, it works for spring crops and also fall crops. And I'll show you how to use it at the very end. But you know, it takes the place of having to go to a computer to do this. Okay, now you wanna select the, the you know, different varieties of vegetables, okay. Chalet carries Renee's Garden Seeds, Botanical Interest, Seed Savers Exchange, and Hudson Valley. Now Renee's and Botanical Interest, and I believe Seed Savers also are only sold in um, uh, retail garden centers. They're not in the box stores. So you can get varieties from them that you just can't get from, you know, from the other uh, huge, huge you know, suppliers. But Renee, I know Renee Shepard personally, I've known her for 30 years and she is just remarkable. She started with a, a catalog business of seeds called Shepherd Seeds. It was bought out and then kind of forced out of the business. And then guess what? The internet took over. So she does internet sales and then she has the seeds in garden shops. And, and this is her, their philosophy. This is Renee's philosophy and quote unquote, we work hard to find the best sustainable and organic growers with the skill and the expertise to produce high quality um, germinating seeds that we know can we can count on to ensure our gardener's success. They target all of their selections for beginners and all of the varieties are per, Renee's personal selections and they're chosen for great flavor from the garden and all the way in through the cooking table to garden to table cooking. They're also selected for productivity and they're the top performance in, in the, 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 the gardener's home gardens. She, she is just delightful and her webpage is wonderful. She shares all her recipes. This is what the setup looks like right now, this moment at Chalet. And these are all of her um, vegetables and flowers. She also has a separate display of container uh, vegetables and flowers. These are plants that work beautifully in containers. Anything with a container on the label, and I'll show you a photo of that, is excellent for growing a container or also for growing in smaller gardens. If you have a raised bed garden that has a small area, these are the great crops to use because they're smaller, but they're just as productive. Here are a close up of the packages of that display, and you can see. They are all shown in, in bowls or containers. That's how you know, ah, oh, this is a good container product. And this little container eggplant up there on the upper left-hand hind, little prints, ah, oh, delicious. And they're cute miniature little, little eggplants. You, you just slice them up, you don't have to, and you just stir fry them and they're delicious. Um, this is my favorite zucchini, it's called Ostia. And it's a small zucchini, it works great in a container, or it doesn't take much space in my, raised bed gardens. And I get gorgeous, delicious six inch long zucchinis that are about an inch and a half in diameter. These little window box tomatoes, little bites cherries, cascading out of a, a hanging basket or a window box. Delicious, absolutely delicious. This is one of the dwarf variety of tomatoes. I'll talk about that later. These are all her herbs. They're in a, they're in a, separate, a separate rack. Okay, and then I love all the information she has. She has a wind to plant chart. So if you're there, there's a starting indoors, 
early spring, early summer, and midsummer. So it shows you all the different times to start those vegetables in your garden. And I'll, I'll explain why in a few more minutes. Now, Botanical Interest is another just fabulous high quality seed company. And it's Curtis Jones and uh, Judy Seaborn are the founders. And the, they, they also wanted to promote high quality seeds and only work with uh, retail garden centers. And it, incredible. And they started out of their home, just like Renee did. And, and they've both been in business for over 30 years. Um, and then, okay, so I'm going to just keep moving on. What's great about their seed packets, they have just, everyone's seed packets are wonderful, but I particularly love botanical interest because when you look, when you open it up, you see the seeds are in a smaller little, uh, you know, little packet. And then there's all the details on the outside. But when you open up the inside of the packet, there are all the specific details about planting. They even have recipes on how to use them in the kitchen. So it's, it, you know, you always look and always read all the information on your seed packets. Okay, this is what their racks look like. And they have a whole rack of vegetables. They have a whole rack of flowers. So, so you know, and they're alphabetical based on the crop. So, you know, you know, you know, asparagus, A, well, that's not a seed, but, you know, you know, um, beans, and, um, and then carrots, so it's all alphabetical based on those crops. And then they also have larger packet size, and it's particularly good for um, um, plants that you're going to do multiple cropping on. So like bush beans is one of those. Bush beans, um, they, they get to a, the packets to a certain size, they make all their flowers, and then they set all their, all their fruit. And then you harvest. And the reason I like bush beans is that you can have enough for a whole dinner of people. Whereas pole beans, you harvest all week long to get enough for, you know, for dinner for people. When, when you harvest from the bush bean, you rip them out and start another row. Or actually what I like is I start you know, a, a row and another row um, two weeks later, and then another row two weeks after that. When I harvest the first row, I rip those plants out, plant another row of seeds where they were. So that's how you manage your crops all the way through the growing season. Okay, now Seed Savers is another wonderful company and it started with people that were um, saving seeds, that um, heirloom seeds that their ancestors had brought over from their home countries with them to, you know, when, when they migrated here to the United States. And they have all these wonderful stories about all the seeds. And um, they're, they're, they're saved because number one, they have probably excellent flavor and or they're very, very productive or they have something like, it's not in the line this year, but um, it, they have a bean called lazy housewife bean. I think it's not politically correct anymore. So I don't think you're gonna see that one anymore, but it was a stringless bean. So you didn't have to pull the strings off of them. And it was great for lazy housewives. Um, so you, I, you don't repeat that story. Okay, I'm kidding. Okay, so now these are the variables that you wanna consider uh, in, when, in the selection process. So uh, their, their disease resistance, days until harvest, germination time, like how many days it takes to germinate, and then the plant size. And this is all really important. Plant size is important because you don't wanna put your really tall plants in front of your really short plants. You also wanna have the orientation of your garden so that you have the, you know, the, you, I like to have mine, I, you know, I always designate where north is and south is because the sun is in the south sky shining on the garden. So your tallest plants are on the north side of the garden. So they're the tall ones, they still get the sun and then the shorter ones it, and it staggers down to the shorter ones onto the south side of the garden. Okay, let's keep going here. Now I wanted to show you the difference between heirloom examples and, um, and, and then the hybrid examples. Oh, there's the lazy housewife bean I was talking about. Okay, so the heirlooms, so like black crim is a wonderful heirloom tomato. Italian Roma is an heirloom. Uh, the gourmet blend is an heirloom. And that, like grandpa, grandma admires lettuce is, 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 is an heirloom. And heirlooms, um, they're known for seed retrieval. You can always retrieve seed and save it at the end of the season to keep, you know, and share it with people. So you always have it going. They usually are valued because they have phenomenal flavor. 
They're very, very sustainable and they have memories. They have memories. Um, they're not as disease resistant though. So that's kind of the one thing that I like to encourage people, you know, grow a few heirlooms, but don't, don't plan on them to be your whole crop because if we do get disease uh, conditions, man, it can wipe them out. Hybrids are wonderful because they've been hybridized for disease resistance. Um, there are a lot of varieties available. They're also readily available, uh, you know, because we always have, you know, new ones. And they're, they're again, new hybrids every, every season. Now look, look at these seed packets. And this is a great one from Botanical Interest. And you can see, this is the tomato um, bush Roma and it, it has its Latin name in, on it. Uh, this is a certified organic seed. And um, then, okay, this is an 80 days harvest. So that's the days to harvest at the top. It's a warm season crop. And what that means is you don't wanna plant this till after the danger of frost has passed. And I'll explain that more. Okay, so um, it's a determinate type tomato. It means it grows to a certain size and then stops growing and then produces all its fruit. And then this VFN resistance, that shows that it is, it is resistant to verticillium, fusarium, and nematodes. And it is an heirloom and it describes it here. You look on the back, the botanical interest have these wonderful seed um, um, stake labels that you can cut off and paste to your labels, which is very handy with all those, you know, all those uh, information, days to emergence, five to 10 days. Um, you know, it's, it's um, the, the depth of the seed is a quarter of an inch. Okay. And you know, it has all the, all, like I said, all this great information on it. And then there was information inside the packet. So disease resistance, I talked about, days to harvest, I talked about. Oh, I want to show you so this is the bush tomoroma. We talked VFN, that was verticillium, fusarium, and, and nematodes. Okay, the, this is, oh, this is a great little tomato. Tomato, cherry, sugar, sweetie. Oh my God, it's a little cascader. Delicious, only a 65 day tomato. Phenomenal. You, you get tomatoes that quick after, and the, the, that harvest date goes from the time you put it in the ground, not the time you start the seeds. Okay, and then this one is an indeterminate, so it just keeps growing and growing and growing and cascading. And it's a cherry tomato. Okay, uh, let's go ahead. Germination time. Now, this is on the back of Renee's seeds, and you can see this um, over on the left hand column, it has all that information. So it's, you know, days to germinate seven to 14. So you write that in your notes, and so watch out in the garden, you know, and you plant, you put down the day you planted it, then you know. So it should start coming up a week to 14 days later, depending on the soil temperature. Now there's soil temperature and ambient air temperature, and I'll, I'll talk about that more. Um, okay, and then the mature height, this goes five to seven feet. This was the Camp Joy cherry tomato. And then uh, the, the transplant days to harvest, is a set, it's a 70 day tomato. And then there's all kinds, there's this little flap that Renee always has and you open it up as a description and then has more details underneath that flap. Now, these are the recommended supplies. You want a soil less planting mix or seed starting mix. I'm gonna go into more details on this. Wooden stakes to label the trays or plastic stakes to label the trays, a seedling flat or pot, a thermometer for soil and air temperatures, topsoil, peat moss and perlite to transplant into because uh, you want a heavier mix for the roots to get used to living outside in the garden. Uh, a water soluble fertilizer or transplanting solution. You need artificial light in the early season if you don't have a good source of sun. Or if you have a sunny window, you need to have six hours minimum sun coming through that window. Here are the excellent quality fertilizers that you, you can get at Chalet. Dr. Earth is my favorite tomato and vegetable because it lasts 60 days in the garden. And then and tomato tone has always been one of our favorites. It lasts 30 days. And then we also have the starter fertilizer, Biotone, that has the mycorrhizae fungi in it and also beneficial bacteria. Always have a good source of water, okay? And then the question is, you wanna start from seed or transplants? And there's benefits uh, and disadvantages to both. Okay, with, the seed, with seed, there's more variety. You get many more varieties on those seed racks than you get out in our sales yard. Uh, you, can you can control your growing environment. You can keep it really organic. And if you want, 
And then you can also control your timing. Uh, when you do transplants, number one, it's instant gratification. If you didn't think ahead to start your tomatoes in March, which is the time to start, then when you come into our garden center in May and you see those gorgeous tomatoes, oh man, I forgot to start the sun gold tomato. I'm just gonna buy it and put it in my garden. So there's that instant gratification. Quality, a lot of times if you're not, if you don't have good light quality, you're not using your fertilizer correctly, you can get real leggy, leggy stretched seedlings and that really reduces your quality. And that can affect your crop all the way through the growing season. So a lot of times you have better quality if you start with you know, professionally grown transplants. And then the other thing is transplants are available at the proper planting time. So, so that, you know, it's, you know, it's, you know there's, there's good and bad on both. I, I do both, I do both. Okay, so improve your success during these, using these tips. Seedlings need a, lo a lot of light. And there is a benefit if you can get self-watering seed starting systems, I'm gonna show you some. Uh, use a good seed starting medium. I'm gonna go into those details. You need to fertilize your seedlings. Once they get their true leaves, once they get their true leaves, you, you are responsible for giving them the, the nutrient they need. Okay, ventilation is also very important. And then read those seed packets. I kind of am gonna repeat that a lot. Now you wanna use a good seed starting medium. Skip the garden soil and invest in this soilless mix you know, to give the seeds your best start. When you're growing the seeds indoors, the soilless mix it is a finer, lighter um, and texture. And it's, it makes it much easier for the young seedlings to, for the roots to get established and you know quickly. So it's really worth it to get the seed starting mix. So the main reason to use the sterilized seed mix is that it reduces the, the threat of mold and fungi that can kill the seedlings you know, with what we call damping off and, the, and it, they can really ruin your hard work. Uh, and then these are sterilized seed mixtures. And so they don't have any contaminants or pathogens. And so it really creates a real healthy hospital home um, for, for your seedlings. You know, and until your seedlings develop true leaves, they're getting all the nutrients they need from the embryo and the cotyledon seeds. But once those first true seeds show, and I'll point those out in some seedling pictures I have, then you need to uh, provide the, 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 the fertilizer. Our, the seed starting mix that we carry is from Espalma. It's 80 to 90% sphagnum moss. There is perlite mix in it, so it gives good aeration and good drainage. There's a little limestone in it to adjust the pH, and then it is treated with yucca juice, just like our chalet mix is, so that it's, it's, it's moist out of the bag and it rehydrates quickly. So, so that, that, that's really important. Okay, now, another thing that you need, I, I would get a medium-sized container with a lid, like, you know, just like a, like a you know, like a, like a, a small garbage can. And if you have one already, just wash it out really well, sterilize it with 10% bleach and water, 90% water, rinse it well, then add your seed starting mix straight out of a bag, and then pour in a, a bit of water. I would say like two to three cups and mix it thoroughly to moisten it, put the lid on it so it'll moisten all up. And then you've got moist medium to put in your seed starting trays. You also would need a soil scoop and it helps you do that to get them in your seed starting sprays. And then um, you can fill your propagation trays. I'm gonna show you details. You need to have plant tags. As, as much as you think you're gonna remember which row you planted with tomatoes and which row you planted with eggplants, you will not. So plan to have either the plastic tags or the wooden tags and then mark the name. I always put the date too that I, that I planted it. So I can look back and say, oh, how long has that been in the ground? And, and I can see the germination rate. You, you wanna have a good, a good marker or grease pencil. The Sharpies are the best, so it doesn't wash off. And then you always ha also have a sandpaper, sandpaper or a nail file because some seeds need to be sclerified. So like uh, lima beans, you take a file and just, you know, just file um, the, the seed coat open piece two, then it, the, the water can get in quicker and it will, they will germinate more readily. So these are just cool tools to have on hand. You also need a small container with a lid in case you have to um, um, stratify some seeds. And mostly that's with perennials. So um, most, uh, most vegetables, you're not having to worry about that. Now here, here's, these are my, this is, these are my hands. And on uh, some seed trays that I use, 
and I'm just showing how to take the moist seed that's starting at mix and put it in and firm it down. So I'm firming it down. Um, you know, you don't want to jackhammer it, but you just don't want any air pockets. And then I'm showing how I take my seeds and then you can see up in the upper left hand, I'm making two indentations with my fingertip. And then I'm putting two seeds in each seed pocket. So that way, or each, each cell is what that's called. That way I don't have an empty cell and, 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 and I get now the tough, the tough thing about this, oh look, here you can see one up in the upper left-hand side, you can see those little seeds down the bottom of those, those small holes. And then, then this is important because look how everything germinated, woo! But look down and the lower, the lower photo, this is the tough thing. Um, when, when you have two seeds germinating, you're gonna pick the one that has the thickest stem and you're gonna cut the other one off. So, so you just want one plant growing in each cell. I know it's just the hardest thing to do, but, and you don't wanna pull it out because sometimes those seedling roots can have, um, they, they wind together. So you just snip off the top of the plant, the other roots die and you, you get a really nice, healthy um, seedling. Now to encourage it, a lot of plants like tomatoes and peppers need warm soil to germinate well. And moist soil is 10 degrees lower than the ambient air temperature. So if you can put, you know, get a heat mat, put them on your, on your, on your, in your, um, your trays and under your trays, um, these have a thermostat on them and they usually keep it at, at, at a static 70 degrees. And then that helps, that keeps your soil at 70 degrees so your seeds will germinate more quickly. And the quicker they germinate, the better, you know, the, the better head start that you get. Okay, now we use a cover on, over our seed trays only to increase the humidity. So with, when seeds are germinating, they need humidity and heat. They don't need light yet. So humidity and heat. And I used to tell people if they don't have, uh, you know, you know, heat mats, put their seed tray like this on top of the refrigerator because it's warm up there. And then check them every day to see if they've germinated. Once the seeds germinate, so like as soon as those seedlings come up and you have the green leaves, take that top off during the day so it, it gets the highest light level that, that you, can, you can give it, whether it's from artificial lights or from a window. So, you know, so, and you, you can put the cover back on at night to keep the humidity high around the plants, but always take it up. You're not using it like a greenhouse. That plastic really reduces the light levels that are coming through. You wanna have a spray bottle because um, when you're first watering seedlings and seed, you know, seed trays, if you would pour water on top of, you know, the, 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 seed, seeding, the, the seedling mix and, and, and the seeds, it's gonna wash the seeds away. So when you start with moist mix, that's why you moisten it, keep it in a container, put it in, firm it in, and then spray the surface, especially you know, take the lid off, spray the surface, and it's not gonna wash the seeds away from where they're, where they're starting to, to grow. Okay, another option is to look for self-watering containers. Um, these are the compressed seed plugs that you just add with water, they hydrate, and then, and then th this is a self-watering set. I'm gonna show you some other ones. Um, this is another option. I love windowsill seed trays. And this is a company called Plant Best. We have a whole bunch of this in right now. I particularly like this because it's narrow enough to sit on a, a windowsill right next to the window. After they germinate, you wanna put them in as bright light as you can. And new seedlings prefer high, high light and cooler temperatures so they're not stretching for light if the light isn't strong enough. Um, so, so you take them off your heat mats and you know, put them in the window. I particularly like this set because you can see the insert cells. Um, they're attached when you first take them out of the package, but you can break them apart and separate them. So you have four separate trays of your different crops. And then there you have, it comes with the, the, the dome over the top. So this is a cool set. Now, this is what the seedlings look like after you've edited out the other seedlings and you're growing them on. And these are true, these are the true leaves, the true leaves. Uh, if you look down uh, on the, the one in the center and the one off to the side, 
those are the cotyledon leaves and they're, they're smoothed edges. The true leaves actually have the, the classic tomato, you know, zigzag edges. So you can see they're getting, they're getting stronger and stronger. And then, and then once they get to be four inches tall, you can pull them out and see that they have really well-developed root systems. This is when it's time to, and you never want to let a tomato get dry. Um, and you never want the roots to get stunted as it's developing. So when it's about four inches tall, if it's not time to set them out in the garden, it's time to pot them up into like a four inch pot. And so this is, this is you know, how you do it. You take the four inch pot, put potting mix down in the, in the bottom, and then and, and, and with a different level of, and on tomatoes, tomatoes can be planted more deeply than, than they were initially grown because all up and down the stem, they produce extra, extra roots. It's the one crop that we have you do that to. So see, then you plant it in, firming the soil around the side, and then on the top, and then um, that's what it looks like. And then this is how it grows in and you get this beautiful plant that's ready to go out in the garden with all these extra, extra, extra roots. So it'll really get it. And then this is what you're aiming for, that great crop. Okay, now these are the seed starting supplies, um, how they look in the store. I just took this picture yesterday. So you can see the, 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 the plant best um, trays that I was talking about over here on the left. And then on the right, these are the jiffy pots with you know, the, jiffy, the, you know, the jiffy plugs that can go in. And um, we, have, we carry both. Um, so the, 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 the jiffy is made with peat. And then the, um, the, the plant best company uses a lot of coir. Coir is uh, coconut fiber. So, um, and then there is a real benefit to using you know, artificial lights. Um, these are, um, this picture is of a fluorescent uh, light. These are the T5 um, LED lights. And you, know, you can get you know, elaborate stands with you know, different, you know, with adjustable lights that go up and down based on the, the height of your crop. Uh, you wanna run these lights 12 to 14 hours per day. Um, maybe even 16 hours a day to, to equal what a full sunny day is outside. It's best to use a timer. And so this is, um, this is an example of a grow light station with full spectrum bulbs. Full spectrum bulbs means that they, they have light that goes from the red um, zone all the way to the blue zone, rather than just warm white or cool white. And then what's nice about these, uh, the one on the left is it has adjustable chains to, to, to raise and lower the lights to keep them within, you wanna keep the light levels within um, eight, eight inches of the top of the leaves, the top leaves of the plant. Um, this one on the, on, on the right is a neat set that we have in this store right now. And it's, it's an LED light. Actually, LED is the way to go and the way to grow. Um, and because there, it's less heat, less electricity, so much less electricity. And, um, you know, it's, it, it, it really, it, 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 if you bought Christmas lights this year, you saw everything was being switched to LEDs. Okay, this is the Grow Light Garden. It is from, it's from a, custom, a, a, a company called Sun Blaster. I think this is phenomenal. This is a self-watering uh, light system. And this one is the micro size, it's the, the little micro size. What's cool about it, and I took a picture looking down on it and also looking up on it so you can see where the light is on, you know, under, underneath. Here's, here's how the self-watering system works. Um, it, these are the elevated legs in, in the system. You put those right on the tray. Then there's the wicking mat and it's part of the self-watering. And it, this is what it looks like just laying on top over on the left. And then the way you use it is that you lay it flat on the, on the risers and then tuck an end down on each side of the tray. Then this tray is gonna be filled with water and it will wick it up. And then these are the planting trays that sit right on that wicking mat. And you can see the small little indentations, there's four that actually have contact with the wet surface and then it pulls that moisture up and it works with capillary action 
and it can self-water these, these, these trays for 14 days. Incredible, incredible. Now this, I showed you these photos um, earlier of, uh, of, of the plant best with the tray and the, and the four separate tracks. Now we also have the Miracle LED Company. This is a 45 watt grow panel. And you can see it has all the different light colors. So there's white, there's the blue, there's the red, and it covers the whole full spectrum range of growth, you know, for plant growth. So this is pretty handy and you, you can see how it's hanging. And then you can put several trays underneath it, you know, on a, on a shelf. We also have the Miracle LED bulbs. And those are the ones that are on, on you know, on the left-hand photo. These bulbs fit in any light fixture. So like a table lamp, you know, uh, we also sell the, the light fixtures that, 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 that are, oh my, I forgot the name of it. It looks like a trumpet, you know, and it aims right at the plants. And then we also have the tubes. These are the T5, um, HO is um, high output. And these are 48 inches long. Uh, you do have to have a T5 um, fixture to put them in. But they're, they're very good. Now, if you're going to use classic, you know, fluorescent bulbs, and a lot of people have that, um, you want to you wanna do a combination of a warm white bulb and a cool white bulb. And because cool white is the blue range, warm white is the red range. So you get a brighter. Now, but you want to rotate your plants each week. The light from the fluorescent bulb is more intense in the center than the end. So you have to move your plants in and out so that you get equal light. Uh, you want to replace the tubes you know, when the ends get dark, because that means the tube is old and the light output is less than half of a new bulb. Um, you want to clean your fluorescent bulbs each month, the dust and dirt, you know, wipe them off because it really increases the light that's, you know, that's emitted. And then uh, place your hand where the light hits the foliage. If you feel any warmth, then the light is too close. And there are some growers that prefer the fluorescent because they like the heat that the bulb puts out because they have like three layers of their lights and, and the layer of uh, the shelf and they don't have to use heat mats when they do that. So, but it's gonna be harder and harder and harder to find like the fluorescent bulbs like this. Timer is so valuable, a timer is so valuable. It goes on at six in the morning at my house and turns my lights off at 10 at night. And th so they stay on 16 hours. Okay, when you have so many heat mats, grow lights, you know, the, the thermostats, you know, electric heat mats, all that, you, you really need, you need, a, you need an extension cords and a power strip so everything can be plugged in. So those are good things. Now, these are the expert tips for planting out. Once you get the seedlings, and I'm jumping back and forth about what you're doing, but hardening off is something that's really important to understand. Hardening off means to acclimate your indoor grown seedlings to outdoor conditions. So you slowly introduce your seedlings to the great outdoors for about 10 days in a row. It means placing them in the sun for an hour or so on the first day and then gradually increasing more time each day. If you, once you harden them off, you avoid, you avoid the sun scalded leaves later. So then, you know, so then you need to water, you need to protect the plants from sunburn initially. And then the basic tools you always need, shovel or a spade, a garden fork, a hand trowel, and um, you know, watering. You know. Now this is what to plant. The trick is to grow what you and your, and your children like to eat. Kids' favorite crops are basil, beans, carrots, chives, cucumbers, lettuce, marigolds, radishes, sunflowers, tomatoes, and zinnias. So getting started, you wanna pick your garden spot. You want at least six hours of sun, direct sun shining on that ground each day. And you need to, again, de determine, determine the north side, make sure you have good drainage. So if you dig a hole and it doesn't drain within two hours, then it, it, that's not good drainage. And you would, you would consider doing a raised bed just to increase the drainage. Don't go too large. Your first garden size would be, should be 10 by 10 maximum till you get used to what you're doing. Okay, so then you dig the garden. You're going to remove the grass, uh, remove the weeds, loosen the soil up, and then you want to adjust the pH by adding sulfur, add organic matter uh, like leaf mold or um, you know leaf mulch 
my favorite is the um, is the uh, uh, Cottonburg compost because it's like a hybrid cross between leaf mulch and shredded bark mulch. Uh, then mix all that in with a spading fork, rake it rake it smooth, and then consider a fence. Okay, so planting again seeds. You need to make stakes with the seeds and seedlings. Firm the soil around the root ball, water, and use a transplant solution. Okay, again, I talked about the best fertilizers. There's, there's, there's organically based ones versus synthetic. And actually, the plants can't tell the difference between the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. The big difference is organically based fertilizers actually um, support the soil microbes. And so that's why we encourage you to use organically based as often as you can. So that Dr. Earth is excellent, Espoma is excellent. Uh, synthetic is a faster feed, and, 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 but um, synthetics can have a little higher salt content, so it tends to kill the microbes. The microbes always come back, but it, I, we, we really encourage you to use organically based. Now, why is the frost-free date so important? Our average, it's the average date of the last hard freeze of the growing season. Here in Chicago, it's May 15th. Okay, so now that is the distinction between the cool season crops and the warm season crops. So cool season crops are spinaches, radishes, lettuces, things like that. Warm season crops are tomatoes, peppers, squash, corn. And, and those plants will not do well if the cell temperatures and the air temperatures aren't warm enough. So this is your guide for your planting schedule. So the cool season crops, again, lettuces, radishes, spinach, anything in the cabbage family, anything in the onion family. Okay, so you count backwards from the, the frost-free date, so May 15, to start the seed. So you go back eight weeks, and then and, 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 and that's, that's when you start your warm season. So they're ready to plant out on May 15. So tomatoes, peppers, squash, bean, and corns. Radishes are cool season. They're easy from seed. They're really fun for children. This is my good friend, Scott Thalman, with one of his neighbors that he used to always plant with. Cabbages are excellent, cool season cabbage, Brussels sprouts, and broccoli. Lettuces, oh my gosh, lettuces. And I like to encourage you to do leaf lettuces because head lettuces here in our high humid conditions aren't as successful. So always look for the best leaf lettuces and you can, you can harvest them from the side or you can you know, cut them off and eat the whole head and just plant seeds again. So I love lettuces. And then the growing and planting tips for these cool season, you know, start lettuces and things at the same times as scallions, radishes and cool season spots. Set the plants out starting in early April and they're usually ready to eat by the first week in May. Scallions, these are cool season. You can either use starts, which are little, little seedlings or little, little plugs. Uh, little little bublets to put them in, or you can germinate the seed in seven days, and they're really delicious when young. Leeks are a cool season crop. Again, start from seed as early as March 7th, but be sure to thin those rows out so that there's room for the leeks to develop. This is a great example of growing leeks. Carrots, carrots are kind of tough. Okay, carrots work better in containers where you have a light friable soil. Our soil is so heavy, that unless you're using a specific variety like Nantes, which are short and fat, Royal Chantenay are also great for heavy soils, but many people, they take a long time to germinate, 25 days. So I used to always think that the rabbits were eating the seedlings before I got to them. They take a long time. So they're better, they're better in containers. Okay, now the warm season planting schedule, tomatoes, peppers, squash, beans. Tomatoes, there's four different varieties of tomatoes. Determinate means they grow to a certain size. Those are the, a certain height, those are the ones that are mostly used for canning because the crop all comes at the same time. Um, but here where our seasons are short, you can get as much production out of a determinate as an, almost as an indeterminate. Indeterminate just keeps growing and growing and growing and getting taller and taller and taller. There are the semis, and then the dwarfs are the newest ones that were developed and released about five years ago. Dwarfs are designed to be small plants and produce like at least a two inch size tomato and they can grow in a pot as small as 10 inches in diameter. So the dwarfs are really cool. So kind of keep your eyes open for the dwarfs if you have a smaller garden, or if you grow in, um, in containers. I'm gonna skip this and keep going. Peppers, there are sweet types, hot types, and ornamental types. And um, the sweet types are the, like the Cubano, 
They are delicious for fried peppers. And then there's so many incredible hot types, you know, the, like, um, like the, the Tabasco variety, um, the, um, the habanero. And, and there are a lot of people like to, to brag about growing the hottest types and there's many out there. Okay, you wanna use a water soluble fertilizer when you plant them. These are plants, peppers are plants that do not like to be hardened up. So wait till the very latest time to get them out in the garden. And then they like a lot of water. Cucumbers grow the non-bitter types. They're the, they're, the, the more disease resistant. Okay, like the, the, the straight eights um, are my favorite, my favorite. Okay, um, eggplants, use any of the varieties um, in, you know, in our area. I, I like the long, narrow um, uh, Japanese types because you just slice them crosswise and fry them up. You don't have to do a lot of peeling. Okay, green beans, there's the pole types and the bush types. I talked a little bit about that earlier. Um, I grow both. I, I, I'll have some pole types just because they keep going all season long, but then I have the bush types when I want to have more people than just my husband and I for dinner. So I can, I can, I can, I can harvest a whole, a whole, uh, I'll do three plants for uh, dinner for, for four to six people. And then I replant them. Kentucky Wonder Bush is an excellent one. Okay, and then we're gonna keep going. Squash, zucchini is so much fun. It's so easy and it's so good for beginners. There's so many great varieties. And uh, then there's summer squash and winter squash. Okay, and then herbs, they're annual bur er herbs like basil, cilantro, dill, fennel, and parsley. They're perennial like chives, mint, oregano, sages, tarragon, and thyme. And then the tender perennials are like bay and rosemary. Uh, you have to move those inside over winter Put them out during the summertime. And then, um, then, okay, then taking care of your garden, you want to make sure you have fertile soil. That means, you know, using a fertilizer on, on a regular basis. I love the Dr. Earth because you just do it every two months. It lasts 60 days. So, you know, you, you really eliminate a lot of work that you're doing out in the garden. You have to have at least one inch of water a week at 65 degrees or when it's cooler. If it's warmer than that, add another half inch of rain or supplemental water each week. Sometimes that means watering your garden every other day to make sure you're keeping it nice and hydrated. Mulching helps keep the soil more moist, also prevents any weeds. And you wanna use common sense pest control. These are recommended pesticides. These are the earth-friendly natural ones. So we have eight um, and, and it has a sulfur and a pyrethrin, an organically derived pyrethrin. Eight and then the tomato and vegetable, are the same ingredients. Then they have the copper fungicide, and this is the liquid copper, it's called copper actanoid. That prevents most of the, the, the fungal problems that our plants get. The active ingredients to know, clarified extract of neem oil, that's the neem oil, and it's a repellent rather, and it, the oil actually coats insects and can kill them. Uh, Azadiractin is the active ingredient in neem. There is potassium salts of fatty acids, who no said, is derived from a bacteria that grows in rum vats. And it's, it's, an, it's an exudate from that bacteria and it's derived and put in Captain Jack's spray. And that's a, an, a very effective insecticide, but the insects have to ingest it. Sulfur works to keep fungus and it also kills spider mites. Copper is great because it takes care of fungus and bacteria uh, like leaf problems on plants. Uh, these are the oldies, but still goodies. The synthetics are malathion, carbaryl is seven, permethrin is eight, and acephate is a systemic. Uh, the earth-friendly ones are horticultural oil and then the potassium salts of fatty acids. And these are the hose-in sprayers and then the concentrates. Both of these are sulfur and pyrethrin. And you'll see these. Noidorf, I wanted to point this out to you. Noidorf, see this logo, the, 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 the sunflower? Nordorf is the originator of Earth's Friendly Natural. And so you can look at the back of the different products. If you see their logo, you know that's an Earth Friendly Natural product. And they supply to many, most of the companies here in the United States, they're, they're from Germany. Systemic fungicides are great um, for early season tomato control uh, and fruit control. This is um, myclobutanil and, um, uh, Propraconazole is infused. Those are the active ingredients. And then we have the contact um, fungicide. This is uh, chlorothalonil. It used to be called, oh my, dacanil, dacanil. 
So it's a really good contact, very broad spectrum um, fungicide. And then the earthly natural copper sulfate and this straight elemental sulfur. Public enemy number one are rabbits. So you have to either, you know, you ha either have to backspace, you have to either spray and fencing is probably the most, the most effective for rabbits. Plant seed is excellent for rabbits and for deer. And it's, it's, an, it's, it's um, uh, organically derived. It, it's actually a blood-based product. And um, so from bovine and porcine. And this last 60 days sprayed on the plants. It also works as a fertilizer when it breaks down on the leaf surfaces. Uh, and then there's good, 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 good repelsol. And it, it's, it's, it's labeled for all of these insects and completely earth-friendly natural. And it just irritates the nasal passages of the animals. So they just leave and they, 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 won't, they won't eat your thing. And then liquid fence, again, liquid fence, the rabbit repellent is, is the best one because it has cinnamon in it and capsaicin in it. So it, it really repels. Slugs are another major problem. They'll eat holes in your tomatoes. So you wanna use sluggo and sluggo is iron phosphate. And then the sluggo plus has spinosad in it. And you can use these granules and sprinkle it even in the vegetable garden. And then I talked about fertilizing. Uh, one of my favorites is the root and grow over here from, uh, from Bonide. And it's an excellent one when you're first starting plants. It's a 4103, so it has that high, high phosphorus to get the roots established, plus a rooting hormone. And then there's Dynagrow, and then the others that I spoke about earlier. Again, close up of all the Dr. Earth, your tomato and veg, bud and, bud and bloom, and rose and flower. And then, then, then most, the next thing that you have to always focus on is harvesting. This is the, the reasons to harvest is to keep the plants productive. If you're harvesting, you take that hormone away from that, the fruit that's on the, on the plant that tells the plant that their job is done. If you're harvesting, then the plant will keep making flowers and keep producing more and more and more for the, the, through a season. So you wanna enjoy your favorite recipes. Boy, I hope your garden looks like these, these baskets this full. Now, and again, let's go ahead. Avoid these common mistakes, not enough light. I'm gonna say that again, not enough light. That's probably the number one problem. Uh, too much or too little water, starting too soon. Don't get started too soon. Don't get started too soon. And, um, you know, and, and then, then you have to be really tough. Oh, don't plant too deep either. Plant only as deep, with the exception of tomatoes, only as deep as the root wall was, was originally um, growing in, in the original pot. Tomatoes go more deep. Um, you, you have to be really tough. If you have weak seedlings, get rid of them. Start over. And then don't get seduced by too many seeds. Don't, and, then, and then make sure you're labeling. Labeling issues are one of the biggest problems that we have people, people forgot to label or they lost the label and they don't know what they're planting. Okay, so now listen, this is a great example of a garden. This is one of Scott, Scott Bauman's gardens. This is my garden, well, a hundred years ago. And then, um, and then this is the quick summary. And I, I, I don't want to read it too much. Now, this is the reward for staying to the end here, everybody. And um, you can see, this is the spring. You set that red line on the frost-free date. So you, you'll be moving it over to May, you know, to May 15th, which is our frost-free date. And then the FP shows the first planting of that crop. SI is start indoors. And then it has all this other information as well. And uh, let me just go, I think I'm at the very end here. Let's do this. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna just, I'm gonna stop sharing this screen real quick. Stop share. Here we go. And then I can show you this and there's one for you free here. Okay, so this is spring and see how I'm gonna set this on the frost free date. This is the coolest tool, the coolest tool, okay. Right now, I've grabbed one that's not going to work. Oh, good job, Jen. Here, this one does work. So we're going to pull this out. Okay, I have this set at the frost-free date. Okay, see right here. Here's the frost-free date. There we go. All right, now you can see each crop. Each crop, you follow across like the tomatoes. There's tomatoes down here, and you can see how it says start inside at that date, which is March. And then first planting is the, the, the last week of May. And then it shows you when you start harvesting and how late you'll harvest. And then see all the red instructions right here. Oh, I'm doing this pretty well. 
Okay, so then this shows the, the depth to plant the seeds, um, the distance between rows and the distance between each plant when you can. All kinds of information. And then you also have it on the back side is the fall. And for the fall one, I'm gonna take the instruction sheet out. See, it has this instruction sheet right here. You take this out. And then here's the fall. And you put the fall date on the first date of the first hard freeze. There you go, see right there? And then this does this for fall crops too. So this is such a cool tool. So come inside, say that you attended the webinar and you get a free one. And they're at the diagnostic desk, you know, where the, where the microscope is. And uh, it's yours, it's yours free for the taking. So um, I'm gonna look at the questions. We've got four questions here, Q and A. And are the container seeds good to grow to full maturity inside? Basically, can I grow them now over the winter? Well, th that's a good point. Um, the container ones, if you, um, Fern, if you had good artificial light, you could, you could grow them in a container. You could grow them in a container for full size, absolutely. But you must have 16 hours of light a day, okay? All right, that's good. Okay, then anonymous attendee, I've been watering the bottom of the seed tray. Is that good or goo? I don't know. Okay, okay. If, if the seed tray had moist seed starting mix in it, then the capillary action will work, pulling the water up. If, it, if it's dry at the, the, at the touch, a lot of times it won't wick it up. So be really careful about that. And usually it is best to water from the bottom when you have seedlings that are just getting started early. But let it, let it, you know, soak it up 20 minutes, pull it up, let it drain. So you, you know, you want to have that that moist and drain, moist and drain action. Okay, all right, and done. And then uh, this is oh Susan, hi Susan. Um, do you feel Quar is as good as the seed starting mix? You know, Susan, I, I like Quar as much as the seed starting mix. And what's interesting is the research I've been doing on Quar is that it, it dries out so beautifully and gets aerated so beautifully that in, and, um, it, 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 it is easier to control it from being waterlogged. Is that, is that a good, that's, that's the best way I can say that. So I, I, I really like, I really like, the neat thing is we've added Quar to our chalet potting mix. I'm so thrilled that they did that. It makes it a really high quality product now, even higher quality. Okay, great. Here we go. Oh, oh, I'm, okay. Yeah, here we go. Anthony live. Okay, she's done. Okay. Oh, here's another one. Can we grow potatoes here? Yeah, we can. But the, 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 the thing with the potatoes is, and you can actually grow any potato that you like. And you can, if you, if you have one from the grocery store, cut it into to eight, you know, eight quadrants, if, if that wouldn't be quadrants, I cut it into eight sections, making sure there's an eye on each of the, of, of the pieces that you've cut apart. Let it air dry for about three to five days on, the, on a counter. And then, then you're gonna plant them and get them started. Out in the garden, it's better. I like to use, I like to use like a laundry basket and then I put a, a, a you know, a, like a, a, a liner around the edge of the, the laundry basket, cut holes in the bottom, fill it up, and then fill it with a good potting mix, like the chalet potting mix or the Dr. Earth vegetable garden mix. And then I plant my um, my, my potatoes in there, and then they, they grow up. And as the plant gets, you put them in the bottom and then keep piling the soil up all the way up to the top of the basket. As the plant grows, then it produces the potatoes inside that very nice friable soil. It makes harvesting so much easier. So that, that is a much better way to go than trying to plant in our, our heavier clay soil. You know, it can be done in our clay soil, but um, they tend to be very surface oriented, you know, that way. So, so try that trick with the laundry basket on top of the, the surface of the, of the garden and then let them grow up through it. Really fun. Okay, I'm watching the time. Oh, we're getting good, very good. Um, okay. Oh, done. Okay, this is Carol Green. I put my question in the chat. What potting soil do you recommend? Is miracle Grow any good? I particularly don't like miracle Grow because it uses, um, it uses small or short fiber sphagnum that is dusty and uh, it doesn't hold moisture as well as, as using a higher quality long fiber sphagnum. 
The other thing that I really don't like about miracle Grow is that they put on there that they have a fertilizer in there that lasts, you'll see different labels, some for four months, some for nine months. Unfortunately, when you look at the, um, uh, the formula of the, of the fertilizer, it's, it's 0 0.08, 0 0.12, and 0 0.08 nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. It's not even one full percentage of any of those nutrients. And so it deceives the grower into thinking that they have fertilizer in their mix and they do not. And that just enrages me because it really deceives the home gardener. You need to add the fertilizer. So I'm not, I'm not, I guess you can tell I really don't like the miracle Grow buying cell. We do sell it though. We do sell it. I think we have better quality. Okay, um, let me see. Oh. Oh, this was interesting. I'm not used to doing it that way. Send privately. Huh. Okay, this is Door, Door St. Clair. What's the best time of potted cucumber to buy at Chalet to avoid disease? Well, it's the, it's the you, you want the, um, the bitter, the, 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 oh my God, straight eight. They're the non-bitter types, the non-bitter types. And, um, and, it, it, there's disease that you're dealing with. And then the other thing you're dealing with with, with cucumbers is the spotted cucumber beetle. That's an insect. So, so always look for the non-bitter types, okay? All right, this is good, done. And then, okay. All right, another anonymous. If I'm starting from scratch in a garden bed, can you recap what soil I should use to fill the bed? Oh, okay. This, if this is for a raised bed, then I like, and I can give you the, the, the exact um, number of bags based on the size of your garden, but you can email that to me at jenniferb at shallynursery.com. But I like to recommend that you use a combination of, of, of a topsoil, one third topsoil, one third um, cotton burr compost. And then I like to use one third of the, uh, Dr. Earth Garden Mix because it's a nice starter. Um, and so, yeah, there we go. Okay. And then another anonymous, do you put holes in the bottom of the laundry basket when growing potatoes? Absolutely. Yeah. You have to have holes in the bottom of the, of the laundry basket. Yeah. Good, good question. Good question. Oh, thanks. You were listening. Okay. And then Carol Green, thanks for your answer. You're welcome. You're welcome. And it's, it's three after 11. Man, I came in right, right in the finish line. So um, I'll check the chat too, but I think it was Carol's questions in the chat. Uh, wait, did I do that right? Yeah, here's the chat. Q&A. Oh, there's the chat. Oh, I got him. Perfect, perfect. Okay, okay. That was, wait, let me go. And there's three more chat questions. Okay, thanks for your answer. My cucumbers grow beautifully at first and produce lots of fruit, but then get ugly and crisp leaves. Oh, anonymous attendee, they, they need lots and lots of water, especially when the fruit, the, the, the fruit is there. So that's one of the plants that I actually, I'll actually go out and water mine every day, but I have a raised bed. And so it, it drains so quickly, but especially when, and we've had two just horrendous growing seasons where it was so hot and so dry that it, it was tough. It was really tough for the cucumbers. It was really tough for cucumbers. And I feel like, you know, I'm one of those Cubs fans. Hey, there's always next year. There's always this year. Don't give up. Try again. Try again. Yeah, that was, that was, last year was just really tough. Really tough. Okay, here we go. And all right. And this kid's in here. And some live. Done. I think. I got everybody and we still have, oh, we have still have 34 people with me. I love you all. This is so great. Um, I'll look forward to seeing you in the store. Uh, make sure and come and get, it's in a plastic like, holder thing like this. It has, uh, some of them still have um, the old, old price tags on it, but I marked through them saying no charge. So come and get your uh, garden planner and, um, and thank you, thank you so much for um, attending our webinars and uh, be sure, come and see us, come and see us. All right, thanks, bye everybody.